this year's seniors on both Hall and Connors. Right now we'll start with the Connors seniors. First up, Catherine Blaine. Carly Dorman. Faith Haverty. Maggie Murray. Maya Feigenbaum and Gwen Geisler. Congratulations to all the Connor senior girls. Next up is the Hall senior crew. Number one, Caroline Grant. by her parents, Craig and Ann, and her sisters, Maggie and Isabel. Hey. Caroline will be attending and playing across at Ithaca College next year. Next is number seven, Sabrina Portal, escorted by her parents, Sarah and Joe. Sabrina will be attending and playing lacrosse at Western New England University next year. Next is number 12, Audrey Thompson. Escorted by her parents, Tom and Nicole. Audrey will be attending the University of Chicago next year. Next up is number 15, Cammie Cho. Escorted by her parents, Doug and Robin, and her sister Grace. Cammie will be attending and playing lacrosse at Amherst College next year. Next up is number 21, Erica Rothenberg. Escorted by her parents, Alan and Sue, Erica will be attending Penn State next year. Number 31, Gabrielle Gershon. Yeah. Escorted by her parents, Abner and Julie. Yeah. Gabby will be attending Georgia Tech next year. Yeah. Congratulations to all the Hall seniors and their families. Good luck next year. calling out the starting lineups for both teams. We'll get to that in a minute.
start off with the honored starting lineup. At midi, number one, Gwen Geisler. <laughs> On defense, number five, Maggie Murray. <laughs> On defense, number seven, Maggie Venora. <laughs> At midi, number eight, Jillian Haverty. <laughs> At attack, number 11, Kate Schaefer. Attack, number 16, Ali Toussaint. On defense, number 17, Faith Haverty. On attack, number 22, Anna Tchaikovsky. And Vinny, number 26, Maya Feigenbaum. On attack, number 29, Lauren Massaro. On defense, number 43, Catherine Blaine. And in goal, number 74, Maggie Yezza. Now for your Hall High Warriors. At attack, number one, Caroline Grant. At attack, number two, Natalie Nordyke. At attack number three, Chloe Nordyke. At midi number four, Tori Condon. On defense, number seven, Sabrina Portal. On defense, number eight, Olivia Popperlo. At midi, number 12, Audrey Thompson. <laughs> On defense, number 16, Margaret Grant. <laughs> At attack, number 19, Avery Polk. <laughs> At attack, number 21, Erica Rothenberg. At midi, number 22, Ann Tulakangas. And in goal, number 31, Gabby Gershon. Please stand for the national anthem. Take your hats off. Take a moment, think about all the brave men and women around the world working hard to protect the freedom for us to enjoy a game like today.
And good evening, everybody, and welcome to part two of our lacrosse doubleheader. As now it's the girls' turn as the Hall Warriors take on the Connor Chieftains. West Hartford High School Sports on Channel 5, presented by the War Chief Sports Council. Pete Lammer, along with Steve Boyle and our fine Channel 5 crew, we're at Chalmers Stadium here on the campus of William H. Hall High School. And both of these teams, again, like the boys, headed to the state tournament. And for Meg Sersosimo and the Chieftains, another dominant season. 11-2 on the campaign, outscored their opponents by more than 100 goals and leading the way Steve Boyle, Ali Tuzian. Ali Tuzian. Yes, uh, um, Ali, uh, Ali Congdon is, as well. And I just yeah, some, Congdon some, on one side, Tuzian <laughs> on the other. And, and Tori Congdon, as we uh, talked about before, called by Meg Chaplin, the best freshman since Alana Boyle. How about that? Well, that's a, 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 a generous statement, if, if nothing else, obviously referring to uh, my now 20-year-old daughter. I can't believe it. Uh, yeah, the, uh, Tori is, has got the moxie uh, of a scorer. She's uh, certainly been somebody that... Um, like Allie, uh, just has a nose for it and uh, really knows um, aggressively uh, how to find, her, find herself in front of that cage and finish it when she gets her opportunities. And again, looking at the goal scoring for this Connor team, 11-2 and two on the campaign. Steve, 192 team goals in 13 games. I mean, that is just absolutely dominant. That's averaging about 15 goals per contest. And look at these gaudy numbers. Uh, you have 47 for Fagenbaum. You have 38 for Geisler. You have 26 for Kate Schaefer, 19 for Jillian Haverty. They spread it around, and they just really, really score at a uh, just a prolific rate. Yeah, it makes it a challenge for any defense when you can't uh, key in on just one or two players because – you sort of pick your poison and, and you try to take the ball out of the hands of who's, you know, what I would call the point guard, who's the general out there. But they've got a lot of point guards and they've got a lot of scorers. So if you, if you decide to focus in on two girls, you got two or three right behind them who can put up big numbers if you take the focus off. Hall team, on the other hand, uh, sort of a struggle last year, 3-13, and 13, but a renaissance season for them. 8-6 and six for Meg Chaplin's team this year, and they've done it with arguably without their best player, Cammie Cho, who continues to be out with the ACL injury that she suffered during soccer season. Sure. So, yeah, losing a player like Cammie, who I had the chance to coach, uh, played a lot of minutes for us when she was a freshman and unfortunately had that horrific injury uh, to lose not only the rest of her soccer season, but her... her uh, her lacrosse season, which is the sport she plans to play in college, the Hall girls have really done a nice job. What, what can happen sometimes is when you have a go-to player like they did in Cami, you get a lot of kids watching. Uh, certainly Tori has come up and has replaced as best she can the shoes of Cami Cho, but then it's also allowed for some of the more veteran kids to find a role in the offense and uh, spread things around a little bit. One of the things that Meg Chaplin talked about that's been really eye-opening for her and her team is the fact that beyond Tori Condon, how many great, impactful players they have as upper underclassmen. They have a ton of freshmen and sophomores making contributions this year, and you can go right down the list. Uh, you can go to Chloe Nordyke. You can talk about her, Juliet LaRock, uh, your daughter, Shabon, who will miss the game with a concussion, also a sophomore, Maggie Grant. You can go right down the list. A lot of freshmen and sophomores getting key minutes, playing big roles, and making a big impact on this team. Yeah, and that's how you sort of... Uh rebuild the program if you will uh, obviously after the down year last year you hope that you're going to get some kids that stay with it don't give up on it and uh, it's a tremendous coaching staff between you know coach chaplin uh, coach rachel tringali who is a hall standout when she was here in the in the 90s went on to play at monmouth college where she was the number three assist getter in the nation um, in one of her seasons former division one coach at ccsu anytime you have a division one coach on your staff you, you know you're going to be able to build some uh, some players jill jengris uh, really great role models and um, so they're they're looking to, to do it the right way take your time uh, build the culture, uh, build on what we've, what we've had in the past, and uh, there's a young group that's given them the opportunity to do that. Meg Chaplin wanted me to point out uh, her favorite statistics of all as she refers to Grace Polk and Erica Rothenberg. They've caused more turnovers than they've committed turnovers, and she said in this sport, at this level, that's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, spoken like a true defender. Uh, <laughs> coach, coach, uh, coach Meg was in charge of the defense when I was coach, and uh, she was a defender in college. Uh, 
when lacrosse wasn't played by a lot of women in the country, and she really values defense. So the fact that she pays attention to stats like that, you're going to see as part of the the culture of a team, and I'll refer to that word culture often as a coach, is, uh, you know, what are the things you value? And she values assist-to-turnover ratios, uh, and she values um, uh, ground balls and, and, and creating turnovers as opposed to giving the ball away. Back to the Connard side of things, again, 11-2, and two, as we talked about, currently ranked third in Class L, and maybe a potential tournament rematch with Darianne that they suffered a big loss to a couple of years back. Uh, they have just the two blemishes on their record. They lost a tough game to Glastonbury by one. They were also beaten by Daniel Hand of Madison. This is certainly a team that is a big-time contender in the state tournament, aren't they, Steve? Absolutely. Anytime you have the amount of scores that they have, it's going to come down to possession and, uh, quite frankly, what you're doing on the defensive side. You know they're going to get their goals, but really, are they going to be able to uh, keep control in the midfield, make stops when it's important, and then uh, not turn it over in transition? Because if they can get into what we call settled offense, and they, can, and they can do their thing on the offensive side, the more opportunities they get to do that, the better the chances are they, they can upset a team like a Darien. This Connor team defeated Hall in both matchups last year, 15 to five and 13 to four. That was en route to a 14 and two regular season last year. And for Meg Sersosimo's team, three consecutive winning seasons since uh, the 2013-14 season, which wasn't a bad one in its own right when they went 500 during that campaign. You talked a lot during the uh, boys broadcast about building the culture. She's certainly built the culture here. Well, it's funny, when I first saw Meg coach, I really never saw myself as a, um, a girls lacrosse coach. I remember being at a track and field uh, meet that I was coaching in and looking over on the infield. And my wife was coaching in the youth ranks and at the high school level at that point, and I knew girls lacrosse well enough as a dad. But I remember just watching the energy in this practice and looking out at Meg coaching this team. And I think it was probably her first season. I had heard they had had a coach who had played at UConn, who had coached at UConn. It was probably her first year. Little did I know we'd become friendly rivals not many years after that when I took over the helm at Hall. And um, I was always nervous co coaching against her because... Um, I knew she'd be prepared. I knew she knew the game a heck of a lot more than I did. And, um, you know, during that time, I, I think I was just best with, blessed with better players. And as a result, I was able to have the edge. But she's, she's created a, a wonderful long-term culture. Obviously, they're meeting with consistent and great success. So uh, kudos to a, a wonderful person and a wonderful coach. Now in her seventh year at the helm, hard to believe how time flies that uh, seven years have come and gone since she took the job as the uh, head varsity girls lacrosse coach here at Connor. The War Chief Sports Council would like to thank our many fine sponsors, including those at the all-state level, and they include Keating Insurance, MACA Plumbing and Heating, Reed and Reed PC Counselors at Law, ESPN, College Prep Express, and the McConnell family law group and as we mentioned espn just want to send condolences out to the family of the longtime face of the franchise chris berman who tragically lost his wife uh, last week i got a chance to uh, spend some time with uh, the bermans in terms of choate rosemary hall alumni functions uh, they had the uh, funeral and, and ceremonies at the choate chapel yesterday and uh, Tragic, tragic time for the Berman family, especially the kids, Doug and Meredith, and uh, certainly our hearts and best wishes go out to them. Yeah, I have a lot of friends that uh, work at ESPN, and certainly he was legendary. And to come on the heels of some of the cuts and uh, that were happening on the staff side, um, you realize there's a human impact there, but there's, there's no greater loss than the loss of life. And so, again, um, my condolences as well to the Berman family. So a few moments before... We get things underway. The nightcap of our double header, as it were. The Connard boys triumphant, 12 to three in the uh, early contest. Game that they led start to finish. If you didn't join us for the first portion of our broadcast, they raced out to a four nothing first quarter lead, led nine one at the half and pretty much had things their own way in what became a more defensive minded struggle in the second half. Matt Sersasimo's team ending the regular season above the 500 mark. Both of those teams getting ready for states and 
both of these teams getting ready for the state tournaments as well, Steve, and as a, a former coach, anything in particular that you might uh, be working on or focusing on the week or two leading into the state tournament? Yeah, I mean, you start this process uh, as soon as you start scheduling, um, you know, and, and this is one of those games that is automatically put on your schedule. But what you really want to do is, is make sure that you have a, a sense of what, you, what the expectations are based on where your team is at. Obviously, Hall is thrilled to have qualified for the state tournament given the season they had last year. But Coach Trasosimo knows that the quality of and combination of players she has only comes across every once in a while. And you really want to take advantage of those seasons where you have an opportunity to, to perhaps win a state championship. And that's not out of the realm of thinking. Um, certainly, I, you know, I think she wishes she could get the Glastonbury game back because Glastonbury's been both her and my nemesis over the past you know, decade or so in terms of our work together. Um, but, but she's probably has a much different approach in terms of this game. Connor's expected to win. Hall is expecting to get better today. And I think that those are the two different approaches that these coaches are probably taking right now. Looking forward to the tournament from the Connor perspective, Steve. When I was talking to Meg last week, and again, all of these coaches, all four of them today, and 99% of the time, all the coaches through West Hartford, very generous with their time and helping us prepare for the broadcast. And I asked her to describe her team in, in one word and right straight out, she said, they're mature. And she said, that's what's gonna serve us well in the tournament. Yeah, and, and, and maturity only happens with, uh, with failure right you, ha you have to go through some level of failure in order to have that maturation happen we don't mature when we constantly meet with success and so i'm sure it's the glastonbury and the hand losses that she is able to talk about in terms of you know what are we going to do different when we're faced in those situations again and uh you know she's got good seniors she's got some some young competitive athletes and again it's that combination sometimes um that you wait for as a coach and uh it's up to them to allow that maturity to manifest in success moving forward. Goaltending matchup today, Maggie Yeza for the Connor Chieftains. She'll be opposed by Gabby Gershon. Gabby Gershon had been sharing time with Maya Borden, but Borden, along with uh, Steve's daughter Shaban, out of the lineup today with injury. And the other great statistic that Meg Chaplin wanted me to convey was the save percentage for Gabby Gershon 59 percent we were talking about the boys game how 40 something was was really really good 59 percent for her netminder yeah you know gabby um is just a fun athlete i was still in the soccer program when she had tried out and uh and then she came out for basketball and i i think she was one of those kids i mean i had had maddie hooper in the program where she um someone convinced her like come out for lacrosse and she had never been played lacrosse never mind goalie and it was the following year upon Maddie's graduation when people were like, look, we need competitive sort of fearless athletes to take over the net. She's got the perfect personality uh, to be a net minder. You'll see that what she's really good at is stopping the ball, but because she doesn't have the same youth experience in terms of stick skills, that's, that's where she falls short. She's otherwise a top level goalie, but her capacity to clear the ball is the thing that she's lacking but she continues to improve upon. I'd love to see her play at the next level if somebody can get that part of her game in line with how remarkable she is at, um, at, at net minding. So here's Connor on the attack. They'll get the first offensive foray. And there's a save right off the bat. I think that was an intended pass that was just picked off by the goaltender, Gabby Gershaw. Yeah, so what you're gonna see right here is uh, there's two decisions you can make as a coach. You can either go and uh, that's a nice clear from Gabby. She's make, making me uh, um, eat my words there. But, and obviously, when she's wide open like that, that's going to be one. If she finds the, the uh, attackers coming back or her defense coming back, she'll be in good shape. That's a check a little bit over the head. You'll see that the, there's a lot more calls in the girls' game than with the boys around uh, safety because of no helmets. But back to Gabby, Connor chooses not to cover the goalie, okay. where a lot of times... Uh, you'll see Coach um, Meg Chaplin or myself, we cover the goalie to put some pressure on that person. It's just a style choice. So here's Hall trying to get the game opening goal as they set up to Lakangas with the pass to Audrey Frompson, one of the seniors out there for Hall, getting a senior start today. Here's Victoria Condon. 
As they play catch along the perimeter, Aaron pass, loose ball on the far side, and it'll be countered to control. Just underway, and my first question, Steve, we saw the division of quarters of the boys game here just two halves any any rationale to why they do that or just a rule that's stood forever well you know while u.s lacrosse is the governing body for um for both boys and girls there really are two different games in many ways and that's just one of the many differences um you'll find even in high school prep basketball for example they'll uh uh, they would play halves, where in high school, in the CIEC, we play quarters. And it's right. just really sometimes a coaches and league uh, preference. And there you see Gabby's uh, capacity to, uh, to make saves is tremendous. And um, I, I'm actually surprised Coach Rosasimo, I'm sure this is just her style all the time and why change it now for this game. But... Huh? That was Kate Schaefer, by the way, that uh, was thwarted by Gabby Gershon with the save. Uh, apparently what they've called right there was a block um, and on, on the hall uh, trying to trying to trying to help get the uh, the hall girl free and the referee caught that um, it's almost like a like a moving pick if you will in basketball sure yeah so what happens in boys or girls lacrosse if it's determined a, a shot attempt it's who's ever closest to the ball when it goes out if it was a pass, it doesn't matter who's closer. The other team's going to get the ball. I see. It's Feigenbaum. Uh, Gershon is on fire so far in net. She is absolutely locked in. Uh, I think that might be four saves already. She is, mm. absolutely. And she kept Maya from getting her 48th goal of the season. There's a story onto itself. Mm. They've only played 13 games so far, Steve. She's averaging almost four goals a contest. Yeah, so, in, in, and Maya is a... Again, a kid who's a multi-sport athlete, grew up with soccer as her primary, then moved to some basketball, still doing soccer, and then found lacrosse and um, has had a tremendous high school career uh, in this sport. Uh, you, you see, again, Hall's doing a good job of getting stops, but they, in two possessions in a row, they haven't even been able to get it over midfield. Another stop mm. by Gershon. We have a whistle on the play as well. Yeah, that's called shooting space. Um, uh, I'm going to have to disagree with the call based on that, but I obviously have a better angle from where I am right now. Essentially what happens is the referee needs to, referee needs to protect the player, that if they're, they're in the line of path of a shot, they're going to blow the whistle. Even if the shot goes in, that would have gone to a free position. It's, it's intended to protect the defense. Chile and Haverty took that last shot. That one went off the goalpost and caromed fortuitously right to the netminder Gershon and she's able to control it's interesting Steve all the shots from Connard so far they're trying to beat the goaltender high yeah you know and I and again there's nerves um, they're, they're, they're sort of getting what they want and um, they, they might not have um, thought that Gabby was quite the goaltender that she is uh, I think actually Gabby may have gotten a tip on that and then it went to post so she's uh, again really locked in but I think once the, um, once the uh, Connor girls figure out that bounce shots are the way to go, uh, she'll, she, she should do well. So that's a nice job coming back from the ball there by Nordyke, and now they've got a, they've got numbers as we as we say. And here's uh, Tori, yeah. leading the attack off the pass from Nordyke. Had an angle momentarily, and instead dishes it off to Juliet Larocque. Now this is Caroline Grant. Caroline, who will play at Ithaca next uh, year. Um, Ithaca just played Wesleyan in the uh, NCAA tournament and knocked out Coach Chaplin's uh, daughter, uh, Rachel, in, the, um, in, the, in an overtime game. Oh, my. Yeah. So here comes, looks like Feigenbaum in transition, um, trying to get yeah, a nice job at, of transition D by the Hall girls. Feigenbaum resets, and now they'll go into settled offense. Yeah, the D that time by Erica Rothenberg and Ann Tula Kangas. Keeping Maya from having a shooting angle. So Hall's doing what's called a, a modified backer zone. And so they're not playing uh, person to person uh, like some teams traditionally do. You'll see it looks like Tula Kangas is not covering anybody. She's just shadowing the ball. And so people need to rotate 
Oh. Oh, off the crossbar that time by Jillian Haverty. I'm sorry, Steve. No, no worries. Again, that, that's another shooting space call, and that one was definitely legit because uh, Connor did a nice job of making that extra pass. And as Hall passes, as Hall passes players off, if they don't rotate properly, they're going to get these free positions all night. And the shot goes wide. So this time they tried to go low. Off the stick side of Gershon. Connard controls. We've gone almost seven minutes of the opening half. Still waiting for the icebreaker, as it were. No score. Yeah, and that's really good news for Hall. Um, if, they, if they can keep this score in the single digits, that's, that's their chance to win. Uh, they are not going to win a shootout against a prolific scoring team like this. So got to give a lot of credit to the... Uh, uh, the Hall uh, defense backed by Gabby Gershon, who's really taken away some of the confidence of the Connor girls right now. She's making herself much bigger than uh, she really is in that net. And now the, the, the Connor girls seem to be pressing a little bit. They're trying to f thread the needle as opposed to moving the goalie and just picking a spot and finishing. It's kind of like any other sport, Steve, where you have the underdog and the longer that the underdog stays in the contest, as it were, the more dangerous they become. <laughs> Absolutely, and then all of a sudden, you know, you start to tighten up. You start to point fingers at your teammates. Um, when we played Darian, who was ranked, I think, number four in the nation in the state semifinals a few years back, we wanted them to think we were trying to score. But for the first eight minutes of the game, we ran a pattern play. Up oh, there's another turnover, as you can see. Um, that's Coach Sosimo's. Maggie Venora hit the goal post on a breakaway. Rebound, shot goes wide. Wow. Wow. You have to get again. Gershon is just fearless in there. So, you know, we were talking about not covering the goalie on the redefend, mm. and um, it's paid off. Um, you know, Gabby has not been able to clear it to folks, um, and that's not always on her. It's really on whether or not the girls are getting them, themselves open. But to my point about the Darien game, we, um, we, we ran a disguised stall. So we wanted to make them think that we were trying to score. So it was 0-0 zero, zero after about 11 minutes. Wow. Then, I think it was my daughter, went away from game plan, tried to score, and within two minutes it was 8-1. to one. Oh, my. We, we played them even the rest of the way. But because we went away from game plan, uh, and I'm not and I'm teasing about my daughter because there was, you know, we did well to be where we were. Sure. But, you know, that's what happens. And so um, right now... Hall's game plan, try to stop, use this backer defense. The fact that it's 0-0, zero, zero, if, if you told them they were, they were tied with, uh, you know, almost 10 minutes into the game, they'd be pretty happy at that point. They'd sign for that, yeah. sign, sealed, and delivered, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Clock running, 15.45 to go. It's another shooting space call, so a free position. And they score! Yeah. Chilean Haverty finally breaks the ice. And Connor has a one nothing advantage, 9.23 into the opening half. And uh, upon the first goal of the game, the boys lacrosse team who played before us decided to take their shirts off and, and, and have a cheer. So uh, <laughs> it is nice to see when the boys support the girls' teams and, and, and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and they've stayed here on Moss, as it were. So for Jillian Haverty, 20th goal of the year. And Meg Sassimo wanted to talk about her proficiency in the classroom as well, in excess of a 4.0 GPA. Yeah, I, I, the Haverty's um, cousins and sisters and the great family um, have come through our, our program uh, at 241 Sports over the years. And uh, Jillian is uh, just, a, she's always just had like this cool energy about her um, and a really fun athlete. And uh, it's been really nice to see her have such a, such a good career and, uh, and still enjoying the sport the way she does. So this is the draw in girls lacrosse. Boys call it, the, um, boys call it a face-off. Um, that's a uh, um, number nine you can see went in to do the draw because she's so good at it. If this is her first game back, um, that yeah. is uh, Lauren Mahler who um, not only had a really bad concussion to start the, the year in field hockey, uh, and she's a great field hockey player, but then she had a stress fracture in her shins. She wears the helmet because of the concussion, um, and this is her first game back. It looks like they might be using her just as a draw specialist and then getting her out. And she's another freshman, Steve, another in the long line of underclass girls doing the job. 
for the Hall Warriors. Another big save by Gabby Gershaw. Yeah, so um, that's a nice check for me. Oh. Yeah. Whistle on the play. Well, that was called a held check. Um, you know, the, the top official uh, didn't have that call. Um, in checking in girls lacrosse, you have to snap at the stick and then pop it right back up. If you hold down after you check, it's called a held check, and that's what the referee called right there. Oh, that probably could have been a false start, but um, because the referees were still given instruction, they didn't call that. Off the post. No, it went in. It deflected off the post and goes in. So the counter chieftains take a 2-0 lead. You'll notice that both goals actually were the equivalent of a changeup in baseball. So as opposed to winding up and giving the rocket, what they did is they, in both cases, they just slowly picked their spot. And because Gabby was thinking it was going to come with pace, she didn't time it the way she was on those faster shots. Interesting. Interesting analysis there. So 2-0 the score. So after being shut out for the first 9.23 of the contest, Connor two goals in 78 seconds to open up the lead. Yeah, and this is a game of spurts. So Hall has to just refocus, try to get back to where their game plan was, see if they can't uh, try to uh, snag a goal and keep the score as low as possible. Gwen Geisler on the control for the Chieftains. Coach C was talking about her saying she is the one player that plays every single second of every game, can't get her off the field. That was a nice turnover forced by Antua Kangas there. And uh, we've got some transition going on now by Tori Congan. Here's Hall on the attack. This is Tula Kangas with the pass to Chloe Nordyke. And now they back it out and set it up on the perimeter. Yeah, at 2 nothing, 12 minutes in, Hall should be in no hurry to try to climb back in the game. They're certainly in this game. What happens is if you try to score too many too quickly and you fail at it, you give Connor an opportunity to extend their lead, which, again, I, I think that if the score is under five, with, um, uh, under five goals for Connor going into halftime, that's a, that's a good result for, uh, for Hall. Almost a moral victory for them at that point. Well, it, it, not only a moral victory, but it gives them a chance at real victory going into the second half. Mm. If it's over 10 at halftime, you're, they're probably not going to be able to beat them in a shootout. So they, uh, by a strategy standpoint, should be really happy to just possess here for a couple of minutes unless they have a, a, a real wide open goal. And like you said in the, in the first game with the boys too, give their defense a chance to rest as well. Exactly. So right there, it's a little bit of a force, and there's no, there's no need. Connor's also playing a backer zone, and Meg uh, Sersosimo has played this particular defense for a long time. She runs it a little bit different than, um, than Hall does in that uh, most people, uh, they, they, they pass off differently in, in the back. So if you're a novice to this game, uh, the, the best equivalent I can give you is a, is a matchup zone like John Chaney would run in, uh, in, from Temple in, in basketball where you're really passing people off and you're always looking to help on the ball. Okay. Two nothing the score, 12-15 to go, opening half. Tula Kangas is a true lefty and she's very dominant that way. Uh, I'm assuming Connor scouted her well and know to keep, keep her from being able to go left. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that a good scout would do for preparing for a game like this because Tua Kangas can be very diff dangerous if you allow her to go hard left. Yeah, that's what Meg Chaplin said. She said, you know, that's one way and she's able to exploit her southpaw status is that a lot of players on other teams don't react to the lefties as well. Yeah, you're just not used to it, but it's one of the reasons why it's so important. So here you can see, you know, Hall's making the decision right now. To let that girl chase up top. We're in no hurry. They're trying to suck out the Connard zone because they know how hard it is to get it in there. So they're making a decision right now. Look, 2 nothing. We're plenty happy with that score. Um, we know we can always score two. It's a pretty aggressive check right there. Now that, that's what can happen, too. This might be a card, actually. Yeah. The left-handed status, though? That's how eight-year-old Pete Lamoureux walked 23 times in his first year in Little League. They didn't know what to do with me, Steve. Is that right? <laughs> so this looks like uh, the referee's talking to number five, uh, Maggie Murray. Um, and uh, I didn't see what happened. I, I, I certainly, uh, um, the referee talked to her, so probably explaining why the card came. And um, so now this is a non-releasable 
penalty. So Hall probably says, okay, we were looking to stall, but now we're man up. If we could get the two goals back while we're man up, let's do it. In other words, it's not releasable, meaning if we score, it's not like she automatically gets in. You could score five goals in two minutes, and she could still be in the penalty area. The That's the shooting space right there. The equivalent of a major penalty in hockey is a, they can score as many as they want, she stays in there. Yes. And so what happened immediately, because Conard was down, they had to change what they were doing defensively and put them into shooting space. Tori Condon with the shot and the save by Maggie Yeza. Big stop by the Connor Netminer, who has a 47% save percentage on her season. Yeah, I think Tori would like to have that one back. Um, you know, it's the first good chance that Hall had, and she really didn't do anything to move the goalie. She just came in. It was easy for the goalie to read it, and as opposed to faking high and then going low, it was a pretty easy save at, at that point. Uh, not taking anything away from the goalie, but I think Tori as a good goal scorer would like that one back. But Connor just... Um, as opposed to running out that uh, penalty, just gave the ball back. So here come the Warriors. Look at Feigenbaum's speed coming down from behind. Um, I think she's playing midfield, so she's prone up. She's stopping and uh, has to stop at the restraining line to avoid offsides. Pass from Pomerlo down low, looking for Avery Polk. And again, that's frustration for, by the coaches. I can see their body language that uh, we gained possession with the penalty, and as opposed to just taking our time, settling it, uh, ball was thrown out of bounds, and it's back to Connor, who probably at this point would be happy enough just to kill the penalty before they do anything else. And how long is that penalty lasting? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yeah, it's kept down on the, on the field with the scorekeeper. Uh, the person has to stay right in front of the, the clock, and she'll be told when you can go back to full strength. Maya with the pass to Gwen Geisler. This is Kate Schaefer, sophomore, two-year starter, started as a uh, freshman for Meg Sussamo. Yeah, uh, I know the Schaefer family well, and Kate plays club ball with my daughter Siobhan, who's out with a concussion today, and uh, she's just a wonderful kid and, and a great goal scorer. I'm glad to see she's having such a such a terrific season. Here's Maya. Working her way into good shooting position. And before the shot was taken, a whistle on the play. Clock stopped at 8.58 to play opening half. Chieftains leading this low scoring affair by the count of two nothing. It appears that uh, that's a shooting space call. Um, Maya is so dangerous because you can't tell if she's right-handed or left-handed when she plays lacrosse. And it's one of the reasons why uh, She's done such a good job, and obviously that free position um, gives, her a, gives her a chance to score uh, yet another goal for Connard. Her second of the game, 49th of the season. And the Chieftains lead by the count of 3-0. Yeah, and so again, I, I think um, as if Paul were to review film, um, one of the things as you mature is you recognize time, score, and situation and they certainly would like to get the opportunity back to take advantage of that penalty that was that was awarded them with two nothing uh, and ten minutes to go. So they're back to full strength at this point. So um, and, and uh, you know so again we've got the draw specialist in in Lauren Mahler uh, who's been out with an injury. Uh, if she doesn't win the draw or even if she does, she'll try to get out of the game as quickly as possible because of her uh, shin uh, her stress fracture injury. She goes up against Gwen Geisler, and we talked about how Max Rosasimo called her her Energizer Bunny because she's always moving and doing something. She runs indoor track and cross country, and that's how she stays in such great shape. Sure. If, if Gwen weren't playing lacrosse, she, uh, she'd be an all, uh, an all New England uh, track star, probably in the 1600 or the 3200. She's, um, she's a machine and um, another great kid and uh, great family and uh, thrilled for her that she's going to be playing uh, lacrosse on the next level. Here's Maya trying to do her thing from right out in front and a whistle on the play. So as you can see, the top official is explaining to the bottom official what it is she saw. And um, it appears that uh, Hall was offsides, meaning that they had 
eight players over the restraining line there at the 30 yard line as opposed to four. Okay. And as a result, the player has to go back and then Maya gets it at the top and they put one player behind her. So it's a pretty strong position for Maya to be able to go in and try to get that goal. Um, but they did a nice job of uh, shutting her down and forcing a tough shot. And it deflected uh, high over the net, but I can definitely see your point about her either left-handed or right-handed. I mean, there's like a lacrosse ambidexterity to her game. Absolutely, and it's one of the things that makes her so strong. I mean, I knew her as a basketball and a soccer player, and she was definitely right-hand, right-foot dominant. Uh, it's a great save by Gershon and a nice pickup by Pomelo, I believe that is. Um, I think part of what happened, the reason Hall got off sides there is because you have Mahler as a draw specialist who by instinct just followed the play and found herself on the defensive side. But the game plan, I'm sure, was to get her to uh, come off the field and somebody else went not realizing she had gone back on defense. Connor on the attack. Nice pass and the shot goes wide. Wonderful feed that time by Jillian Haverty, but her Connor teammate unfortunately could not convert. You know, yeah, back to that last save by Gabby Gershon. That's six unofficially in the opening half. She's definitely keeping her team in the game, Steve. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's six on uh, versus three goals. So that's obviously a tremendous percentage, and it's one of the things that's allowed Hall to keep this score uh, within reach. Maya shot again. Gabby Gershon's got the answer. Yes, indeed. Not only that, she picked up her teammate's stick and handed her to her. So uh, she's... she's uh, Helping out in more ways than one. She does it all for the All Warriors, no doubt about it. So, see, this is this is was a challenge for the boys for Hall. They gained possession, but then immediately, what's happening is is they're having unforced turnovers, um, and so it's frustrating as a coach and certainly for the players as well. Um, but it's one of the reasons Connor had a, has had a more successful season. So. Hall is going to the stall again. Um, again, more than happy to keep the score under five goals. Uh, the last time they did this, they drew a penalty, a frustration penalty. And um, so the Connor coaches have to make a decision. Do we want to take the bait, go out, force the action, or are we happy enough with three? I hear Coach Cercesimo uh, barking orders and a little more aggression from, uh, from Connor. So I think that... Um, She's changing things up because she's not happy with the stall tactics that are happening. Uh, so a little gamesmanship, a little chess match going on between the two coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, see the outcome. Tula Kangas and Congdon on the perimeter. Pass goes down low to Fromson. Back of the net, Caroline Grants was 19 goals on the season after a 20-goal performance in 2016. Yeah, and probably would be much higher, except that she missed uh, three to four key matches with a concussion earlier in the season as well, uh, and, and right in the heart of the season. Uh, it actually was, in some ways, uh, was a blessing for the team, and obviously not for Caroline, but it allowed some other players to step up um, and, and show their skills because Caroline was the, without Cammie Cho, was the definite senior leader out there, and uh, like a good captain, she celebrated in the uh, three or four game win streak that happened in her absence. So we actually followed a similar tact to what uh, I can tell you right now, this is likely came uh, from Coach Tringali, um, and okay. obviously with the approval of, of Coach Meg Chaplin. Um, my second year um, with the two of them on my staff, we were going up against a prolific scoring uh, Simsbury team and we held the ball like this for 16 minutes to start the half. Wow. And um, Simsbury parents were not happy with us. <laughs> um, and, you know, but it was, it was the right approach, and we were not expected to win that game, and we wound up winning something like 6-5. to five, And uh, they got a lot of penalties. Um, they were very frustrated, and um, it, it wound up being the right approach. And I, I think for Hall... They knew they were not going to win a game 20 to 18, but they got a chance to win 8 to 6. So this is giving them that opportunity. It's kind of like Dean Smith's four corners. Very similar. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I would not be surprised that there'll be a shot clock in women's lacrosse uh, at the high school level. It's being tested around the country at the college level. I, I, I imagine it will likely happen uh, within a, a couple years. So Coach Sassimo right now, I can see her talking with her staff, trying to make a decision about whether or not they want to extend. But 
I can tell you right now, Hall is going to wait this one out if, uh, if Coach Rosasimo doesn't make the decision to go pressure the ball. With 2.45 to go here in the opening half and the clock running. Connor three, Hall no score. And they got all three goals within about a six minute span midway through this opening half. Yeah, and what happens in a situation like this is once the coaches say go ahead and play, the Hall girls got to be careful to not just try to run it down their necks. Now you just go back into your normal set. You've run off three or four minutes. Um, or you say, all right, yeah, we're just teasing you. Let's come back out and do it. Sure. Um, and and they'll, they might do the stall again. Um, you know, obviously, uh, they'll, Coach Sassimo will talk about it with her staff and her captains at halftime. How do they want to do it? But you can see already that um, teams are trying to extend. I think is that Maggie Murray on the top of that um, particular uh, backer zone right there, num number seven. Uh, the, the, the danger right now, because of how frustrating this can be, is that Maggie's playing on a card. And if she were to get a second card, she'd be out of the rest of the contest. So she has to be really careful as that aggressor up top to not have anything happen even by accident. Like if she has a, danger, a, a check that inadvertently hits somebody's head, she'll be out of the game. And uh, then the stall would have worked effectively because they would have gotten uh, rid of one of their better defenders. It's like the NBA player trying to play with five fouls. Exactly, exactly. So or, right, or one you know, technical as well. Yep. So here's what happened is they, um, they, tr they tr tried to... Uh, they tried to get um, uh, a forced shot in there. They got the turnover. And even if Connor only gets one more goal, I would say the stall had its, had its intended impact. Um, but Hall would do very well if they can go in um, at 3 nothing. Uh, Aaron pass, but controlled by the Chieftains. Lauren Massaro in possession. A minute to go. Good move out in front. And a whistle. Yeah, so in girls lacrosse, um, what can happen is if the referee raises the flag, it's continuation. You play on unless it's so dangerous that they need to stop it. So if Maya had taken a shot there and didn't score, though, then the flag would have been picked up. And uh, so sometimes your coaches or teammates will yell flag, and you'll just drop the ball because you'll get a free position right there. Uh, there's a couple, that's three fouls already on this particular possession, uh, one that he allowed to play on, but here uh, gives the free possession on the foul by Tua Kangas. And Faith Haverty getting set to shoot for the Chieftains. And another save by Gershok. Amazing goaltending performance in this opening half. Really is, uh, you know, and again, on her, on her senior night, um, given where she came, um, it, you know, as somebody in the program to ha be having such an uh, incredible night against a team that is scoring against the best goalies in the state, uh, it's tremendous. Uh, yet another foul. Um, you know, the referees are keeping it clean. Uh, they're, they're definitely keeping control of this game. Uh, they're doing a nice job in that. Um, so another free position here for, uh, for number eight. And here's Jillian Haverty. Yeah, Jillian decides to back it out, get it to her teammate Maya, who does love to score and has a nose for the goal. On that left hand, she's trying to get it. Good yeah. defense that time. Maggie Grant, the sophomore for Hall, staying with her stride for stride. Yeah, it's Caroline's little sister who enjoys playing defense, probably learned it playing against her older sister, is going to play at Ithaca next year. Um, Feigenbaum, as you can see, is setting up with the right hand, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point, well, actually, from this angle, she'll probably keep it on the right. Oh, and she the tries shot a high shot. So 11.6 seconds. Again, it'll be a really um, uh, successful half for Hall if they can keep it at three right now. 10 seconds and the clock running. Kate Schaefer for Connor. One second to go. And the clock's going to expire, and that's the end of the first half. With the score, Connor three, and Hall no score, and Steve, a pretty good half for, uh, for both teams. Yeah, I mean, certainly I think um, it's, it's hard to uh, say what a great half for Hall High School when they didn't score a goal, but it was a great half for Hall High School. I just saw a fist bump from Coach Tringali, who was really happy with the defensive effort. Um, again, I, 
I think most folks coming would have expected Hall, I'm sorry, Connor to have somewhere between eight and 12 goals at this point. And it was clearly part of the Hall game plan. And so anytime game plan works, you go into halftime building confidence and saying, all right, let's keep it going. But we can't win scoring zero goals. They have to have a strategy in order to try to give themselves a chance to win this. At what point do you think they try to step it up uh, offensively in the second half? Yeah, I think you got to um, take your chances in transition. So if you, can, if you have numbers, in other words, you come down five on three, four on two, sure. you go ahead and take that opportunity when it's given to you. But if you don't have numbers, then you pull it back out. And I would say... If you can keep it within three or four goals until under nine minutes, then you have to start trying to win the game. Sure. Um, and, you know, at that point, you've given yourself a shot to, against one of the better teams in the state. Uh, to, but, you know, uh, Coach Sosimo is a good coach. She's gonna, uh, things will be different in the second half. I, I'd be very surprised if they're not. It's a Connor team that has scored 10 or more goals in all 13 of their contests, held to three, but they still have the lead here at halftime at Chalmers Stadium. Again, the score at halftime. It's Connor three and Hall nothing. Steve Boyle and I come back with second half action, but first we'll step aside and remind you that you're watching West Hartford High School Sports here on WHC TV Channel 5 and online at WHC. CTV.org back after this.
try then go work out. And welcome back, everybody, as we get set for second half action. We're at Chalmers Stadium on the campus of William H. Hall High School. Pete Lamoureux along with Steve Boyle and our fine Channel 5 crew. 3-0 the score. Connored in front of Hall. And, uh, again, what do you look for here in the second half, Steve? Well, I imagine it will be more of the same uh, from Hall's strategy and uh, to see if Connard made any uh, definitive adjustments to the, to the stall style. Um, obviously, like we talked about in the boys' game, possession matters. And I would say that uh, probably despite the score 3-0, I you know, we weren't keeping track, but I would say it was almost 50-50 in terms of possession. Uh, but all of Connard's possession was peppering a great goal effort by Gabby Gershon and all of Hall's effort was really to try to run clock and not turn the ball over because I think they may have only had two or three shots on net. Exactly. That save effort by Gabby again. Seven out of ten unofficially and that actually eclipses her season mark of 59 percent. So she's uh, had a phenomenal game in that so far for the Hall Warriors. And all coming off the 9-7 victory on Monday over Avon. That raised their mark to 8-6 on the campaign. Connard an 18-6 win over Southington. They start play today at 11-2. That's a good sign for Hall in, in winning that first draw. Um, they decided not to go with uh, Lauren Mahler, who had done the, the draws in the first half. And um, because that was Tori Congen who did the draw. Actually, no, Lauren is in the game, but she's just playing a straight attack position now. Um, but Hall got it and immediately did not go to the stall tactic. So maybe uh, Hall has decided let's play even after uh, keeping the score where it is uh, at that point. We'll see on their next possession. Here's Connor on the rush. Maya backs it out as she hands it off to Jillian Haverty. They've really done a nice job on shutting down. And we, despite the fact that Maya Feigenbaum has both goal, uh, two of the three goals, they've done a really good job at stopping her and forcing her away from her comfort zone. That was close to being a charge right there. It was pretty good uh, position. But because the defender looks like Tua Kangas extended her arms, the uh, referee awarded a checking foul, a cross check, and has a free position. Again, great job by, uh, by Hall right there to uh, close down that middle gap. Yeah, no shooting lane whatsoever at that point. Yeah, and what's interesting certainly is that, um, you know, my daughter with the concussion, this is really the first game they played without her, and she is uh, she plays a lot of defense for them. So having seen Hall play a fair bit, I'm really impressed with how this group has um, played cohesively with their decisions right there. Maya's shot goes wide. And as defensive-minded as your daughter is, still chipped in with 13 goals on the offense. How about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, she, having followed her sister who, who had just had a nose for it, uh, she doesn't really love to play attack and doesn't have the confidence uh, up there, but she is pretty competitive and aggressive. So speaking of competitive and aggressive, there's that left hand from Feigenbaum that we were talking about. Um, she missed that last one with the right hand and came back with a good answer with the left. So she gets the hat trick. It's her third and her 50th on the season. Milestone goal for Maya Feigenbaum. Yeah, good for her. That's, a, that's a, obviously a hefty number, 50 goals in a season. And um, you can tell that uh, when they want a goal, she's sort of like, give me the ball and I'll create, um, which, uh, you, you know, you want to have a player like that. Um, and then, you know, knowing Coach Rosasimo, she'd love for her to have 50 assists as well. Sure. <laughs> Tula Kangas out of the game for the Warriors as we get set for the draw. That goal came exactly two minutes into play here in the second half, extending the 
Chieftains lead to four at four nothing. Well, that was Feigenbaum's multi-sport uh, play in there. She blocked that girl out like you do on a rebound really well. Knew she'd get the ball once she did it and just earned herself a shooting space call. So she's taken over in a lot of ways right now. She really accelerated, mm -hmm. Steve, after she controlled the ball there. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, a crafty, clever play. And I imagine she'll come in with her left and go to her up. She's been more confident with her left today than her right. I thought she was going to cross it back over to her right there, but she wanted to get the quick shot off. Another good save by Gabby Gershon. And a good outlet pass to Tori Congdon, the freshman. So Leading the attack. Oh, so little cross check there. Um, looks like uh, Tori's going to get a free position. And... Um, Maybe give Hall a chance at their first goal of the game to get it back to the number. Um, oh, no, he called it outside of the scoring area, so it'll be an indirect there. Uh, there's Pass goes to Grant. Back to Tory for a second, Steve. She had her signature game earlier this year against Southington, had a four-goal game. Yeah, I think that was sort of a breaking out party for her is that she, uh, she gained a lot of confidence there and said, all right, I'm a freshman, but doesn't mean I can't take shots and, and score a lot of goals. So from there, it, it really is, uh, I've seen a different kid. I think, <clears throat> you know, we've got to give Connor credit on their, uh, on their defense. We haven't talked a lot about that today. Um, despite Hall's stall tactics, they've done a great job of limiting shots for, uh, um, to protect their goalkeeper, who hasn't had a, um, to do that much work to keep them in the game. Uh, this backer zone that they that they run, they run very well. is very difficult uh, to run offense against, um, and so hard to know if Paul is disguising a stall here, or if they are just um, being very deliberate. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they can stay patient and really wait for that uh, great opportunity. See, this is a speaks to being a young team. Is uh, you know, you're, you're running offense, you're in no hurry, and you give the ball away sort of inexplicably there um, for no reason. Here's Faith Haverty for Connor, trying to take it. The root in their bounce shot goes wide of the cage. Well, you know what? They're giving that ball to, uh, I don't, as Coach Tringali chasing after the loose ball, it appears that they're gonna give the ball to Hall based on what the referee said, but I don't really understand why. Um, it was a shot, and even though the Connor girl tipped it, it's still supposed to go to, uh, to Connor in that case, uh, unless they thought she had a chance to possess it. So at any rate, doesn't matter because Hall gave it right back. And the shot goes off the crossbar. Good setup that time from Geisler to Feigenbaum. And she tried to beat Gershon stick side high and just went off the bar. Yeah, you saw Feigenbaum's frustration. Despite having a hat trick already, she feels like she could have six or seven in this game. And um, she sort of put her head down like she can't catch a break. And uh, that was a pretty good shot. And it just, you know, caught the pipe. That's the mentality, I guess, of a 50 goal scorer, right? Exactly, exactly. It's like, you know, you're, you're a three point shooter and you're 0 for 11, and the next time you're open, you're going to take that shot regardless right. if, you, if you have a scorer's mentality. Um, you saw there on that shot, the ball went out on the sideline because of the way that it ricocheted. And still, it doesn't matter if it goes off the end line or the sideline, it's closest to the ball when it goes out of bounds. When I was first introduced to this sport, when I watched my wife play in a women's league, there were natural boundaries. So, uh, if you played and there was a parking lot nearby, it was first to the car that the ball went under. And I used to love it. It was <laughs> literally you'd play, depending on the on the field you played at, it would just be safety, and you'd be see people running off. Again, I think Hall's losing their focus a little bit. They've uh, they got to stay with game plan, get possession, don't turn the ball over in the midfield, giving uh, giving Connor way too many unnecessary chances. They they could have run four or five more minutes off this clock at this point um, if they can limit those errors. Gershon is having a monster game, comes up with the loose ball right there, uh, really importantly. And as great as she's been in that, the biggest thing that she, I'm sure, would like to talk about, she was voted an academic All-American by U.S. Lacrosse. How about yeah, that? Yeah, that's terrific. And, um, you know, again, a sign for a kid that 
did not come to this sport uh, having having played a ton uh, to leave as an academic all-american is fantastic um, student athlete and that's what you want student first right exactly so again there there's another case where Hall did a great job of earning possession but as opposed to maintaining it and getting it uh, over uh, the restraining line and, and going into their settled offense they've given another shot and the shot goes high and wide <clears throat> I am surprised that uh, Connor continues to try to shoot high on Gabby given the game that she's been having I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna look for some of the, their top scorers to adjust that a little bit um, as their attempts come uh, moving forward in the boys game we saw such success by the Connor chieftains with the bounce shot exactly up oh, there's an unforced yeah you know it may I suppose it was forced but certainly not one you'd expect from a veteran team like Connor to turn the ball over there um, so we've got a uh, we've got numbers like we talked about I don't know if you noticed there, but one of the things that uh, kids forget is that the sun is setting, and that pass went right into the eyes of Avery Polk. She asked for it. The runner doesn't know that she can't see that well. Right. So you really want to run your offense going this way because it can get really hard with this setting sun to, uh, to catch, especially it, it's, a, it's a yellow ball. It, it can be hard to pick up um, if it gets caught in the sunlight. That's a great observation. Well, you can see even the Connor goalie as she turns her head to this side. She's looking into that setting sun right now. So home field advantage. We used to try to get Maddie Hooper on the other side in the second half when, when we could uh, to take that sun out of play, especially on these early evening games. Every tactic matters, right? The you know what? Analysis you got to pay attention to the little stuff, and uh, the big stuff tends to uh, turn out okay. Uh, looks like Murray tripped there somehow, and th as they go to resolve that, there's an issue. Huh? And they call the foul on Murray. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that call. Um, looks like pretty good, clean position defense, but they must be saying she extended her arms, which you're not allowed to do. Maggie Murray, a three-sport athlete, basketball and soccer as well as lacrosse. Yet uh, I grew up with uh, Maggie on my middle daughter Michaela's soccer and basketball team so got to know her great parents over the years and uh, love to see her. She's dealt with a lot of injuries so I'm uh, glad to see her out here playing on her senior day of her, of her final sport. Um, right there was a shooting space call. Even if it had been a goal, Hall's first of the game, they would have taken that back. It's one of those frustrating rules that I'm surprised hasn't changed uh, at, from U.S. lacrosse, but it's intended to protect players. Tula Kangas with a shot. Knocked down by Maggie Eza in goal. That was a case where being a lefty, oh, Avery Polk with a nice knockdown, where being a lefty was it, uh, given out being on the left side. She didn't have the greatest angle, um, and had she been a right-hander, she would have tried to get to the center and, um, and picked either side. It would made it a little bit easier, lefty on the left side. 15 minutes, 10 seconds to go in the contest. Connard leading by the count of 4-0. They led 3-0 at halftime. They've added one goal to their total here since the intermission. So that's number 19, Avery Polk, who has an identical twin sister, Grace Polk, on the team. Uh, Avery tends to play more attack, and, and, and Grace gets her minutes uh, more on the defensive side, but plays both. Uh, again, wonderful kids who um, just really enjoy playing multiple sports. They were both on the varsity and JV basketball team swinging this year and um, have found their niche playing lacrosse as well as field hockey. Grace Polk, one of those that we talked about at the outset with her great defensive abilities causing six ground balls in the first nine games she got handcuffed there again just simple offense trying to reverse run some clock um, it's just a, it's a throwaway and opportunity to win goes away when you continue to give possession away um, the way Hall has at times um, they're giving themselves a chance to be in the game, but then uh, giving the ball away. So here comes Connor on the counter. Nice pass in front. Geisler, though, didn't have an angle, so she backs it back out. Perfect. Low shot, and they score. Faith Haverty picking the lower corner on Gabby Gershon and has given Connor a 5-0 lead. Yeah, transition after the turnover. Um, it's 
Hall has done such a tremendous job, as Meg Chaplin calls a uh, first time out of the game. Uh, you get you get two total for the game, unlike the boys who get two per half. Uh, you you know you're going to use them strategically, and this is a good point, uh, perfect time to call that first time out because connor has got a little momentum. They've got that five goal lead now. They can slow it down. So game plan changes a little bit with the five goal as opposed to a three goal lead. The War Chief Sports Council would like to thank our many fine sponsors, including those at the all state level. And they include Keating Insurance, MACA Plumbing and Heating, Reed and Reach PC, Counselors at Law, ESPN, College Prep Express, and the McConnell Family Law Group. Thanks to one and all for your sponsorship of the War Chief Sports Council. And for more information, go to their website at war-chief.net. And a reminder, join us for our final spring broadcast next Monday, May the 22nd. It's baseball time, and we'll be broadcasting the Mayor's Cup game over at the University of Hartford's Fiendella Field. Join Jeff Kaplowitz and me for all of the action. First pitch at 4.30 next Monday afternoon as Connor tries to win for a third consecutive time in that annual event at the University of Hartford. I think we talked about it uh, during the girls' game, Steve. Quite a treat for those kids to be able to go over and play over there. Not only the boys' game, which we're broadcasting, but the softball uh, players as well. We had the softball game earlier this year between Hall and Connard, but uh, all the kids certainly enjoy themselves. Yeah, you know, in today's age of, uh, of media and media access, uh, never mind just social media, the fact that these kids can play <clears throat> at, at the top high school level and be able to re have the games be televised and uh, and have announcers. It's got to be a lot of fun for them. Uh, I, it'll be interesting just based on pitching rotations whether or not uh, Kyle Jeter can get the mound against Connard, who's obviously the ace for Hall, who started the season with a perfect game, which uh, I was getting texts from Coach Von Meyerhauser and Coach Billing after the game that in all their lives, they'd never seen one live. And wow. uh, whether at the high school level, college level, or certainly professional, a perfect game is a perfect game. And uh, it, was a, it was a really neat way to start the season. And Kyle has since, I understand, uh, gotten a commitment to be able to pitch at Dartmouth uh, upon graduation in a couple of years. Interesting story about that. One of the reasons he opted for Dartmouth, and he had a few other opportunities within the Ivy League, Jeff Billing told me it's because the pitching coach up there is a small feisty left-hander just like Kyle and he said yeah. the, the it'll be a perfect perfect match to have those two working together for four years yeah and you know what's great is when coaches always say Andy's a great kid and yeah. um, you know having a daughter at the school and knowing lots of folks who know the, the good kids he, he that's a term that's used for him by everybody who knows him so congratulations Kyle if you do pitch good luck um, and good luck to both Hall and Connard in that game. It's always a great, uh, a, a great event. And as I knock on my forehead, knock on wood here, it is going to be Kyle Jeter against Mike Matthews on the mound. Should be one stellar pitching duel next Monday afternoon. Well, it'll be fun that you'll be with Coach Kaplowitz, who's, uh, you know, he's one of those guys you'd think was 110 years old when he tells you the stories that of different things he's done over his lifespan like how, how could you have done that in your young life but he'll talk about being a taxi driver in LA and being a chiropractor and coaching in the 60s and 70s and and you know baseball being you know his sport uh, growing up but then he obviously was exposed to being a multi-sport coach as well but baseball is one of his true passions so you'll have a good time with with coach Kaplowitz I'm sure uh, he and I reminisce about our days playing Stratomatic, the great table game of baseball. Yeah, that's uh, Coach Billing would, would enjoy that. He's got that MIT mind and uh, any, just, just any, any, any opportunity to talk uh, statistics and strategy. He, he, his, his Friday night fun is getting the guys together to play Risk. <laughs> and um, so uh, you, you, you'll enjoy uh, getting to, uh, to know Jeff over the years as well, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Jeff Billing, that is. Always, uh, yeah. always enjoy talking to, uh, to Jeff Billing. And uh, again, all, all of you coaches on West Hartford, you're, you're all first class, I'll tell you. Well, I, pr I appreciate so, it. I, I, do, I do miss having a team and, and the camaraderie that comes with coaching, uh, the banter in the locker room with my fellow coaches. So of all the other things I'm doing, that's what I miss most as a result. 
So right there, what you can see is um, that's checking in the girls' game. In the boys' game, you can because there's pads, you can hit into the arms. Here, you can you have to check outside the shoulders, and by rule, it's why the girls can't cradle right in front of their face. You need to give an opportunity to check, and so sometimes you'll see that called against the offense. Um, so you know, Hall again after this timeout, they didn't gain possession right on the draw, but did on a little bang bang turnover. So they're sort of stuck now to say, all right, we've got to score, um, but we also don't want to play up-tempo. Caught between a rock and a hard place for sure. I, I have to think that that's exactly what I was talking about before. Um, that pass was literally right into the sun. During that timeout, the teammates should be saying, let's run it on the other side because that looked like a, a sun in the eyes drop because it was an easy pass, easy catch, and she literally missed it by what looked like eight or nine inches. So um, sun coming into factor there, I believe. There's another goal by Feigenbaum. She's, you know, again, because she was setting everybody up thinking she was going righty, she crossed over so nicely there like you would a crossover dribble as if you're going to then finish with a left-handed layup. She switched hands and went upper, upper 90 with, with a great left-handed goal. Fourth of the afternoon slash evening, 51st on the campaign. Yeah, four is probably her average, and as we talked about before, that it, it could easy enough be eight. She looks really dangerous when she goes down the field because you can tell she's constantly moving, constantly changing direction, and because she's so lethal with both hands, it makes it really difficult uh, to defend her. Hall's done a great job for most of the evening containing her, but um, without her four goals, it's a 2 nothing game. But with them, 6 nothing is starting to put it a little bit out of reach uh, unless Hall can start to get themselves on the map. With 12.15 to go here in the second half. Here's Maya again. And huh? the goal is going to be waved off because before the shot, there was a whistle on the play. Yeah, another shooting space call, which again, you know, Maya's got to be careful. Um, it was shooting space, it was clear. She's so good at what she does, she avoided the defender, but that, that defender was at risk. And there's a right-handed goal by Maya. So just to make sure everybody knew it was for real, she finished one with her right hand. And that's her fifth of the day. And that extends the lead to seven nothing for the Connor Chieftains. So I have to ask you, Steve, yeah. With all the players that we've talked about, Hall in particular, you've talked about multiple concussions. How long until we see in the girls' game the helmets being worn? Well, I hope we never see it, quite frankly. Um, and I, you know, this is me as a dad watching my daughter on the sideline who, had she uh, had a helmet on, maybe would have protected her. But if you look at the helmet that Lauren Mahler has on, the concussion my daughter suffered was a blow to more the cheek and the side of the head. And um, if you put helmets on girls, I can guarantee you it will become a more aggressive game. And so while you might protect the top of the head, concussions happen for different reasons. They happen sure. when you fall. Uh, it's, rip, it's whiplash of the brain. And so what I'm afraid of is that these kids would be swinging a lot more out there and putting kids at risk for other injuries, maybe ACLs, maybe bone injuries. Um, and they think they could hit kids on the head. You can get a concussion getting hit on the head even if you have a helmet on. So sure. I think it would be a real mistake. I think they just need to continue to, to, re, to enforce the rules they have and come up with new rules that can protect kids from over-aggressive play that, that put the head at risk. So I know there's constant talk about it, but real purists of the girls' game, as I like to think I am, do not think it would be good for the game. Okay. Another no. turnover, and here comes Maya on the attack again. So just like in soccer, uh, change of field, often you're best doing it going backwards. So you saw Connor did that perfectly there as opposed to just forcing it down the gut. They reversed it uh, by playing backwards. You'll see that in ice hockey and other sports. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's one of the most effective ways to, uh, to beat uh, the defense in transition. It's a bit of a force there. I think um, you know some of these seniors and some of the kids want to try to get, get their goals. I get that. Um, but no need to force up 7 nothing and uh, wind up being a turnover going to Hall. And that's exactly what happened. 
And again, good D back behind the net as well. Erica Rothenberg, whenever there's something good defensively happening for Hall, it seems like she's in the middle of it. Yeah, I, I, I said, again, Feigenbaum having an incredible game. Uh, really good check right there. Uh, Hall coaches thought it should have been a foul. Um, tough call. Um, but Maya is a feisty competitor. Turned her over right there. Um, you can see Maya looks like she's going to come out of the game right now. She's looking pretty tired or at least rest on the defensive side. I'm sure also, too, with a 7 nothing advantage just nine and a half minutes ago. Don't want to risk any injury. Absolutely. They've got, uh, they're going to need her down the stretch. She, she actually looks like she's hurting a little bit coming off the sideline there. So uh, hope she's okay. Never want to see anybody getting hurt. And uh, trainers are talking to her. Uh, could just be a cramp in this heat. It was in the high 90s earlier today, probably higher than that out on the, out on the field. So mm. we haven't talked about that much in this game, but it's certainly got to be playing a factor and starting to wear down both teams a little bit. No question about it. And even with this surface, Steve, being better than the traditional AstroTurf that uh, a lot of teams and a lot of places had for years, it's still a lot warmer than the regular air temperature. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, the, you can see the black pellets. Uh, Connor's actually getting theirs replaced this season because it's been around for over, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 years, I think. Um, but the older they get, the more the black pellets are exposed, and then that heats the whole surface as you, those black pellets get hit by the sun. And so it just radiates. So what I've always found about having coached multiple sports on this particular uh, field is that the temperature is exaggerated. So when it's hot up here, it's hotter. And when it's cold up here, it's colder. And sometimes that has to do with wind. Like today's breeze is a warm breeze, and that doesn't seem to be helping all that much. Right. 8.55 to go. 8 nothing the score. Connard in front. Gwen Geisler. The one player that Max Rosasmo says will not come out of the game. Just well, perpetual motion and perpetual energy. People certainly know about Gwen as she can run all day. And, um, you know, a good midfielder is probably going to run five, six miles in a game. Well, that's, that's an off day for Gwen Geisler. Wow. Um, you know, and, and here... Uh, you, you see that uh, Hall was able to get that get that rebound. I think for Hall, right at this point, they've done a great job in game plan. It's a 50, it's a 50 minute game. It's a long game. Right. They held them to a, a, a really respectable goal total at halftime of three. I think at this point, if they can get a couple goals, they they'd feel pretty good about that. They certainly want to try to avoid the shutout at this point. That's Olivia Pomerlo for the Hall Warriors. She's a junior. Meg Chaplin was proud of the fact that Olivia caused nine turnovers in her first 11 games. Yeah, I like Olivia's aggression. So she sometimes with the stick um, just tries to run out of uh, danger and then uh, and then give it up. But she, you know, at this point she should be taking a look around, seeing if, you know, you got a couple kids cross field that are unmarked. If she could get the ball over there, she can go back and catch her, catch her breath on the defensive side. Talk about the Sersosimo family certainly having their imprint on the lacrosse program at Connard. Talked about Matt, talked about Meg, and there's the patriarch of the family, Coach C, Rob on the sideline, still coaching up 8 nothing with seven minutes to go. Oh, yeah. I think he's, uh, you know, uh, he, he obviously uh, loves his son, but there's nothing better than when your son marries a, a woman that he loves as well. And uh, he loves coaching with Meg. I think uh, I can just imagine the banter that uh, happens around the dinner table, um, uh, Sunday night dinner over some pasta and meatballs, uh, and, and uh, that it must be a lot of fun for him. Um, I know that my wife's father was a longtime coach, and uh, he had a chance to coach with my wife a couple years, actually had Robert Kennedy's uh, uh, granddaughter on, on, on their team, um, oh, wow. Megan Kennedy Townsend, and just sharing stories and watch the two of them talk about their coaching days together reminds me an awful lot of my late father-in-law to see Rob and Megan out there together. So I uh, love to see it. And, of course, one of the first families of sport in West Hartford, the yeah. Sersosimo family, the Robinson families, for sure. Yeah, to you, I think folks are probably familiar now with the great documentary that came out a few years back. Coach Vaughn Meyerhauser is featured in it an awful lot. 
and uh, Coach Blanchfield and some of the coaching legends around town, but obviously it's all in the family is kind of the theme about it. So, uh, yeah, again, nice to, uh, uh, nice to see Coach uh, Rob Sr. out there uh, still at it. Rob Sersosmo, Steve Blanchfield in particular. Childhood buddies going back many, many years. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I love Coach Blanchfield. I get to see him almost daily in the center or at the coffee shop, and uh, he'll talk to anybody and everybody. And during this time of year, he's got his Connor gear on, and in the fall, he's got his, uh, he's got his Hall gear on, and somehow he, he sort of segues at some point during the season, during the winter. And we would have done the tennis match, except that they scheduled it on the same day as today. So we're yeah. getting them to change the schedule next year uh, so we can uh, do some tennis coverage as well. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and Coach Jim Solomon is an old friend as well and was a real mentor to me when I moved to West Hartford and forever indebted to guys like Coach Solomon who uh, constantly reminded the younger guys of how important the work we, we do is as coaches. Um, no better role model than, than Coach Sal. And Coach Sal and Coach Blanfield together, 900 tennis wins. Amazing. It's really unbelievable when you think about it. Um, I mean, that's, I didn't realize the number was that high. It gives me goosebumps just knowing what great men both of them are. And the longevity and the consistency, just uh, terrific. Absolutely. We talk about, there's a book by Angela Duckworth called Grit, and grit is something that is hard to teach, but it certainly is all about stick with itness. And um, those two guys have stuck with it for a long time and as a result have impacted a lot of lives and had a lot of success. No doubt about it, well said. Five and a half to play. Maya's back on the field, so good news for Connor. Yeah, good news for Connor, bad news for Hall. Um, certainly, uh, you know, senior day, she probably said, Coach, I want to get back out there. Um, this is one of those games where we feel, um, you know, those seniors might have a, uh, a little more say than they normally do in, in, in how things get done. I was going to ask you about that. You had uh, made a, another interesting comment right before the half as Connor scores again to make it 10 nothing, and they will now have scored 10 or more in every game so far this season. You talked about how the coaches were going to talk and, and with the players. How much input would players have besides a game like this generally speaking when you go to halftime and talk strategy or at any point during the course of the game you know it's really um it's really style and so as i matured as a coach over the years i tried to give more power to my players okay. um especially i probably spent 80 90 percent of my life between new york seattle and here coaching girls uh, more girls than boys and i came to realize that um you girls want to participate in the decisions a little bit more maybe than boys do and that there are some kids for whom they need to have that role and you build trust with your players to a point where you can say yeah you know what you're seeing something out there that I'm not and so you get input but that's the power of having good captains as well sure. is that sometimes that can get for a, a, a meeker or quieter player they can use their captains to relay something that we can then so you know, I, I, I coach with Coach Ferguson. He always ends his half times. Anything from any of you guys, anything we're not seeing. And so, you know, I learned from him that player input is really important because now they feel part of the leadership, part of the decision making. And if they give a prescription and you agree, okay, let's do it, and they don't follow through on it, now they've got to own it when we talk about it after the game. So sure. you want to empower your athletes to feel like, what they're but you can overrule you're the coach and just say look I I hear you and I and I appreciate what you're saying but I think we still should move forward with this as a strategy and if you've developed good relationships with your players that back and forth is going to work but if you never listen to them they're probably never going to listen to you yeah that's yeah. true yeah that's true it is reciprocal that's for sure yeah I mean every you know if I, I now get a chance to go around and do a lot of training for for new coaches and I never talk about coaching basketball or coaching lacrosse. I talk about coaching kids. This is just the vehicle. And so what you do is you build relationship. You got to build trust. And part of building trust is listening to people. And Lord knows I've made a lot of mistakes over the years in terms of not listening. And, um, and then also the next day apologizing when to your team as a human saying, look, I, I missed that one or I didn't communicate or I didn't listen to you guys. When you do stuff like that, then the relationship is back and forth and, and kids are going to appreciate you and more likely to do good things for you. Sure.
Well, that makes a lot of sense. As we talked about in the boys game, girls game here, a lot of multiple sport athletes, some of them playing three sports. And that'll segue into something that's near and dear to you, 2401 Sports. And uh, to our viewers, why don't uh, you explain uh, what that's all about, Steve? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these girls, it's really fun for me, have come through our program. Uh, you know, our tagline of life's too short for just one sport really came from a moment of outrage when my now 20-year-old daughter was nine and had gotten picked to be on the local travel soccer team. And the coach said, hey, she's our number one prospect. And I said, look, she's nine years old. She's nobody's prospect. And he's like, all right, whatever. And then he goes on to talk about how she's going to fit into his Brazilian style of soccer. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, I was flattered. It's my oldest child and saying nice things. But I said, look, she's interested in lacrosse. Her mom played lacrosse. And he said, we're no longer interested, simply because she showed interest in lacrosse. And as you know, she went on to be a pretty good lacrosse player. Sure. And had I listened as a parent to that coach, she never would have had that opportunity. And I worry about young parents out there who do listen to coaches that say things like that, because I could have gotten bullied into not playing a sport that my kid thrived in. So, you know, we started the program, and I didn't think it would resonate quite as much as it did. And before you knew it, we were in Washington, D.C., being recognized as one of eight model programs in the U.S., and now we're getting a chance to spread our message beyond just Connecticut, but in uh, states around the Union. So it's, uh, it's been a really humbling but fun experience for me, and you know I, I, I feel very grateful. Yeah, you must be, feel very gratified to see the growth yeah. of it as, as much as it has. Yeah, you know, we're trying to change the culture. We're trying to do things differently in this country, and we're trying to do something about it. Uh, I, I think that Feigenbaum's about to get a card for taking a late shot after the whistle. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, Might have been seen as showing up the goalie. I'm not really sure. Um, but from what I was watching, I'm not sure that's the most warranted card. Uh, but So Feigenbaum's got to sit out. It'll be Hall ball. Oh, actually, no. Apparently on the rule, um, because it wasn't dangerous, it was probably something else. They're giving it to uh, to Connard. And not to condone what she did, but it just shows her competitive spirit. Yeah, absolutely. That even yeah. up 10 nothing with three minutes to go in the contest, she's still out there fighting. Sure, sure. No, that's right. And I think, um, you know, the way she looked at the goalie, I'm not, I, I don't get the sense she did anything deliberately, intentionally, but the referee thought it might, maybe it was a little too much. Goalie was frozen. She took the shot anyway, and uh, I think that's why he awarded it. I'm just surprised, though, that the ball doesn't go over to Hall in that case. But up... Uh, up 10, it's running time at this point, kind of a mercy rule. Um, Connor does not need to shoot again. And the fact that they're down a man, they probably just want to run out the penalty. Um, where Hall, on the other hand, is, should be double teaming and trying to turn this ball over because they, uh, they, you know, they, they, they'd like to get at least one goal to avoid the shutout. Previous touch I wanted to mention was Caitlin Shulkin. I just want to mention about her. Yeah, I, just before you do that, there was a nice check from behind by, by Condon, who is uh, on her way trying to get that elusive first goal. And there it is. Score, they yeah. break the shutout with 2.11 to go. Good for them that they were able to do that. Yeah, it's certainly a lot more comforting to go into, uh, go into the end of the game huddle knowing that you put one up on the, uh, up on the board. Now, interesting is that uh, Feigenbaum should so – is she walking back out there? No, I don't think so. They, they're, they're still down a man, so uh, if, if Hall is able to get the draw, obviously they're not going to come back down from 10-1, but if they could get two more in, that would be pretty gratifying for them at this point. Absolutely. So for Tori Condon, her 29th goal of the season. That's a good freshman effort, and um, so good for her. So again, as we talked about, they're going to come on the short end of the stick here today, Steve, but a lot to build on with all the great freshmen and sophomores they have. This program is in really, really good shape uh, for the next couple of years. Yeah, and it's always interesting to, you know, to talk to my friends in the, in the youth lacrosse ranks to see, you know, what's up and coming and, um, and then who's going to what side of town. I mean, it's one of the real challenges is that if you have a great travel program but you split evenly, you've cut your talent pool in half, but you're sharing it, and that's twice as many kids that get to play this great sport. Sure. So I have no issue with it. It's just when you think about the Glastonbury's and the Darians, the kids who come up together play at the high school level together, where a lot of these Hall and Connor girls were teammates through eighth grade, and now they got to be competitors. Changes the whole dynamic, that's for sure. 
Yeah, but again, I, I think as somebody that's such a proponent for kids being active for life, the fact that we can double the numbers, um, while we'd have an all-star team and probably would win a lot more state championships and compete with the Darians and Glastonbury's at a higher level, um, really what matters is the fact that these kids are all having a great high school experience and the opportunity to play high school lacrosse. Yeah, you get twice as many jobs or spots for lack of a better term exactly for these kids to fill exactly so hopefully these are future coaches future moms uh future leaders and um we've doubled the number of opportunities for that level of leadership you can see tua kangas has that nice spin move to try to get to her left hand but connor was certainly ready for it there with a uh, minute to go 10 to 1 the score yeah. Pass right out in front, deflected away. There's a shot, they score again. There's Chloe Nordyke, the freshman, getting her 18th goal of the season. And two late goals for the Warriors, it's 10-2. I believe that little bang, 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 bang play was sister act. It was, I think it was sister to sister, and they were both looking for each other on little short dumps. And uh, so it was nice to, to see the the back-to-back the -back goals there. Hall can feel good about having had that. Now they wish there was about 24 minutes left in the game to uh, <laughs> give them a chance to get back in. But again, exactly. good for morale. Um, you know, 10-2 is more respectable than 10 nothing, and is more in line with the 3 nothing that we had at halftime. Right, exactly. Yeah. And gives them a little something to feel good about as they go towards the tournament. No, absolutely. I, they, look, both teams should feel good about aspects of this game. Connor certainly coming out and doing what they did in the second half, but Hall should feel really good about their capacity to execute, execute a, a proper game plan as the coaches put together today. So, um, you know, it's senior day, so we might see another shot, but um, Connor may otherwise just choose to run it out and uh, call it a day at 10-2 against their crosstown rival. 21 seconds to go. Um, we'll see if we get another draw or not. Pete, this has been a lot of fun for me, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. Steve, uh, a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Yeah. Always enjoy working with you. So uh, right now they're just doing a little trap in the corner there like you see in soccer sometimes. There's a check, which gives the turnover to Hall. Probably just throw it upfield and call it a game. And we'll, yeah. we'll definitely see you for soccer in the fall, okay? Absolutely, love doing this. Uh, if you ever need me for basketball, I've, I've been around that a fair bit as well. So sure. uh, you just uh, you let me know and, I, and I'll be back. Buzzer sounding, and the Connor Chieftains get their 12th victory of the year. They win it in convincing fashion by the count of 10 to 2. And uh, final remarks, Steve, about what you saw today. Well, I think both both coaches have good stuff to talk about at halftime as they enter into their respective schedules for state. Um, you know, Hall still has Danbury ahead of them, which if they could eke out a win there, will up their seating. But um, again, game plan for Hall, stay true to it, keep executing, um, get back to full strength. Maybe Cammy Cho is able to get in for a game or two moving forward. And Connard, uh, keep pressing. In other words, if, you, if your shot's not going in, keep on shooting, keep doing your thing. And I, I wish them both luck uh, moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks again, Steve. Great to be with you, Pete. Terrific, terrific job as always. Steve Boyle joining us on the broadcast today. Double header action and they both go to Connard. The boys winning 12 to three and the girls follow that up with a 10 to two victory. We hope to catch up with the victorious head coach Meg Sousamo along with Maya Fagenbaum. And we'll do that after these messages on channel five.
right column. I took most of them. <laughs> I kind of helped you there. Oh, you got more. I got this one. Oh, we're out of here. Oh, that's, that's hey, how are you? Double header sweep for Connard here today on lacrosse. The girls did just as well, if not better, than the boys, Mexer Sassimo. Thank you very much. What was so good about your team defensively? Keep them off the board as long as you did. Yeah, we were calm, cool, and collected. We were reading them very well. Uh, we sat back and kind of waited for them to attack, and when they did, we seized the opportunities. What was the message at halftime? It was only 3 nothing at the break, and then you guys came out on fire in the second half. Yeah, we, um, we're doing very well all over the field except for finishing. I just said you just have to take your time. You have great opportunities. We're working for great opportunities, but now we just need to finish. So we had to take our time when we were shooting. And speaking of finishing, you've scored 10 goals or more in every single game. That was in doubt until the end, so you kept that streak going too. I didn't know that, so thank you for that stat. <laughs> it's impressive. We have a lot of very hardworking girls on our team. You know, the great uh, baseball historian Bill James says that in any sport, if you have a goal for versus goal against differential, that is as tops as can be, that means you're a good team. Your goal for against goal against differential is over plus 100. That's something. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, we, again, I'm very blessed. I have a, a lot of very, very talented and hardworking young women. You're going to take it one game at a time, I know, as you go towards the tournament. What has to go well for Connor to be successful in the upcoming state tournament? We have to play well all over the field. Um, and we have to have, we have yet to really have a game where everybody's been on. One person's picked up the other and one person's been down. I'm waiting for everyone to be playing at their full capacity. When we do that, I think we could be unstoppable. I asked you to describe this team in one word. You said mature. Maturity gets things done for state championship wise. So I wish you the best of luck that way. Thank you very much. Okay, Meg, thanks again. Guys, what does it mean when you beat the Hall Warriors? Oh, it's just the best feeling. We worked so hard all season, and to finally beat them, it's just what we really wanted. It's great. <laughs> it's honestly one of the best feelings in the whole world. Um, I can't, like, describe more, like, being on this field and, like, being able to beat our town rival is just so, like, accomplishing. You've had a terrific season again. 13-2 and two going into the state tournament. <laughs> That's an 867 winning percentage, if my math is correct. Very exciting. It is very exciting. Coach just talked about having to excel at all facets of the game in the state tournament. I'm sure you agree. Yeah, if we play our game, there I don't think there's any team that we can't compete with, and I'm really excited to see how we do that. 
One other question for you. You had the losses this year against Glastonbury and against Daniel Hand. Coach said that they were both learning experiences. Hopefully that serves well and you can learn from that going forward in the state tournament. Yeah, definitely. I think we just need to stay more focused with that and, you know, hope, you know, like nothing, I mean, not everything could go the way we planned it and we just have to hope for the best and really try our hardest to get to where we want to be. Well, I remember back in 2011, I had the privilege of broadcasting the Conard Softball State Championship. They won the game down in West Haven to win the state title. I hope you guys win a state title, too. Thank you so Thank much. You. So do we. Okay, congratulations on the Thank win. You. The Conard doubleheader sweep today as the girls finish things off 10-2 victory after the boys won the opener by the count of 12-3. Wanted to say thanks to all involved. Diana, Meredith, Jen from the TV side, Paul and Dennis and all our volunteers from the War Chief Sports Council. And a reminder, one more spring broadcast. It'll be the Mayor's Cup. You can watch it live on Channel 5, 4.30 next Monday, Hall against Conard at Fiendella Field at the University of Hartford. Until then, so long, everybody.